Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Penzer. I'm the Associate Director of the Helix Center. Thank you for coming out today for what promises to be a fascinating program on human and non-human minds. Before uh, we get to the introductions of today's participants, uh, just have a few announcements. This is the last of our roundtables for the academic year. And uh, I want to just give you a little bit of a taste of uh, some of the roundtables uh, in the fall. We're going to start out in September on the subject of interdisciplinary investigations. Uh, our John Templeton Foundation roundtables continue in October, Standing Genius, followed by Gene's Computer Medicine. In November, we'll be addressing epigenetics. Uh, we have a new Arts and Humanities program, and the topic uh, toward the end of November will be on translation. Then we're going to have a three-day symposium in December, a Freudian perspective on what ails the world today. And that uh, will be an international uh, event with uh, participants from, uh, from Europe and, and, the, and the States. Then uh, in mid-December, uh, capital with an A, notions, the future of the American economy. Then we continue again with the Templeton Foundation-sponsored uh, Roundtable on Memory, followed by the Meditative State, and then the Realm of Mystery. I also wanted to mention that uh, we had a very successful fundraiser on, on May 8th, and nothing breeds success like success. So I hope it might inspire uh, some of you to consider uh, donating to, uh, to our nonprofit organization so that we can continue to provide you with such programs, and as, as always, they are free and open to the public. So now, on to today's participants. To my right is Alexandra Horowitz, professor of psychology at Barnard College, whose dog cognition lab conducts research on a wide range of topics, including dog olfaction, interspecies play behavior, and attributions of secondary emotions to dogs. Among her books are Inside of a Dog, What smell and know, and on looking, 11 walks with expert eyes. To her right is Diana Reese, professor of psychology at Hunter College and professor of biopsychology and behavioral neuroscience at the Graduate Center of CUNY, whose research focuses on cetitian cognition, communication, comparative animal cognition, and the evolution of intelligence. She is the author of Secrets of the Dolphins, and the book, The Dolphin in the Mirror, Exploring Dolphin Minds and Dolphin Lives. To her right is Theodore Diamond, director of the Diamond Institute, adjunct assistant professor at Columbia Teachers College, who covers the study of the human mental and physical system as a holistic entity. Among his books are The Body in Motion, Its Evolution and Design, and Neurodynamics, The Art of Mindfulness in Action. To his right, Stuart Firestein is the former chair of Department of Biological Sciences at Columbia University, where he studies the vertebrate olfactory system, and he's the author of the books Ignorance, How It Drives Science, and Failure, Why Science is So Successful. And to his right is Berg, research associate and lecturer at Harvard University and author of the Alex Studies, describing over 20 years of peer-reviewed experiments on the cognitive and communicative abilities of gray parrots and me, her memoir of a 30-year collaboration. Now to our roundtable. No, you're going to start it. No, no, you start it. <laughs> you see, that's where we are here. That's the first question. <laughs> Who starts? This is Edgar Sassian, the director, but I think most of you know yeah. him. <laughs> it's so typical that we can't get a, a round table on car right. isn't it? <laughs> Diana, you start. start. Yes. yes. Uh, so I think what we're hoping to do today is talk about, as we advertise, the continuities and discontinuities between human and non-human animal minds. And um, it's, it's wonderful to be 
here together to do this with you, all of us, and we're going to, we obviously encourage discussion, not just us, but you as well. Um, I think some of, the, some of the ways we might start this is from a perspective of uh, Darwinian, the continuity of uh, evolution, emotion, thinking from a Darwinian perspective, uh, as contrasted by a Descartes' view that humans had a body, that they also had this ghost in the machine, a, a thinking substance, a mind. And, the, and again, the view that Descartes had was that other animals only had the body. They were devoid of this thinking substance. And I guess I just want to kick in a first idea here to get us going, that for, for a long time, there's been this, this running debate as to whether other animals think or not. Of course, they I'll just mention this because that you know there were arguments that well parrots certainly are vocal they're using words but it's just devoid of thought okay and their th their thought were dismissed um, and I th I know Irene's going to have a lot to say about that um, and then you know is that you know other animals are doing behavior that looks complex but it's not complex. With that, I think we can just start talking about what some of the things that we're learning. So, but, and I mean that only partly as a joke, actually, because I think one of the difficult issues is, in fact, defining what we mean, first of all, by the idea of continuity and discontinuity, look for it, and, uh, and how to identify what we consider to be conscious or cognitive behavior, whether there's anything to there is a difference between, um, I guess, what you would call uh, um, programmed behavior or, or things like that, or um, instinctive behavior and more cognitive behavior. I mean, I don't, I, I think we know, okay, that's intuitive, whatever, the dog does something that all dogs do and that looks intuitive, and then something cognitive, but it just looks that way. I mean, it's very difficult to actually can I tell a quick story, actually, about this? It has nothing to do with cognition, but it does have to do with behavior and the idea of um, instinct. So, so when a bird, when a, a pi uh, not a pigeon, a um, chicken is born, the very first thing it does when it gets out of the egg is it begins pecking the ground for food. It appears to be an instinctive behavior. For years, it was considered an instinctive behavior. It's a Japanese scientist whose name now eludes me. But anyway, Japanese scientist if you, this is a weird thing to do, I know, but if you spread Vaseline on an egg and hold it up to heat it slightly and hold it up to light, it becomes transparent and you can see through it with a light behind it. I don't know how he discovered that. That's a whole other story, I suspect, but anyway. So this enabled him to take chicken eggs and put them in an incubator and then he smear them with Vaseline and watch the chicken develop. And Develops, it turns out that the chicken develops in the egg with its head bent over this way, and it's bent directly over the region that becomes the heart. And at some point, about four days before the thing cracks out, it begins beating. Actually, I think it's sooner than that, but it's been. And you watch the head of the chicken go up and down and up and down with the beat of the heart. And when it comes out of the egg, it just keeps on going up and down, and then it kind of binds up picking up some food, and well, there you go, right? So it's not instinctive at all. It's a behavior that's learned, in fact, in some way or another. So, uh, so I just think that's a problem that, that's worth discussing, how we, how we make this discriminate. We say discontinuity versus continuity. I don't really know where to draw the lines here studies on the, the gulls. I mean, people know that gulls, parental gulls, have a little red spot on their beak, and supposedly the chicks come out instinctually in that red dot. It turns out what is instinctual is something like what you're describing, a response to something that and they happen to hit the red dot at one point, and mom and dad barf up some food, and, you know, there you go. <laughs> but, it's, it, but it's these things that people... Many of these things people thought were instinctual turns out to have a learning component, to have different aspects, behavioral intuition plus these other aspects. So much of what we do in our lab now is to look at the effects of context, and that's another issue, where we're studying these so many different types of behavior patterns that are exquisitely sensitive to the context in which you study them. And we did a study where um, some people were looking at fish behavior. There's a 
fish that lives in a reef, that they're cleaner fish. And the other fish that live in the reef come over and get them, all the parasites taken off. But every once in a while, another fish comes by, and these cleaner fish will jump out and grab those fish because the local residents, they're going to just sit there. They're not going to come back. But you can, opti you, know, you can basically optimize your, your food intake by jumping out to these other fish. So it's too complicated to explain the whole study. But based on that, people were comparing chimpanzees and these fish. And it turned out a particular task the fish outperform the chimpanzees, okay? So we looked at this, I work with parrots, and I said, wait a minute, my birds can do this really easily. And so we did the task, and the parrots outperformed everybody. But it was the way we set up the, what we call the initial conditions. And when you compare exactly how you experiment, you're gonna find in so many ways different results just based on how you set up the experiment. So this is another thing that people are not sensitive to. When they say, well, you know, this animal does this and this animal can't do this and blah, blah, blah. So much of it depends on exactly how you set up the experiment. Yeah, I mean, I think that what that highlights and what's important to highlight is that we're still trapped in a working for us, right? The instinctive or learning or reflexive versus cognitive. And um, the science that drove an interest in non-human animals, which is a psychological science, really. But they wind up being categories that now we're stuck we're trying to fit our behavior into one or the other, and it might be the ideal realization of most of the behavior that we're seeing. I mean, context, the importance of context seems to me to rise above that a little bit. But somebody will still want you to say, well, is it instinctive or is it learned? Which might not be easy to... There are all sorts of other issues, I think, as scientists that we face, and uh, some of them are you know, we're stuck looking through this human lens at other animal behavior and, and intelligence and, you know, the I word, intelligence. How do you measure that? Is the intelligence of a dolphin the same thing as the intelligence of a chimpanzee? I mean, morphologically, they're different. They're very different environments. They've been separated by 95 million years of separate evolution. We might expect that they'll do very different things. And, you know, that to me, that's one of the most challenging of it, how do you even think about intelligence in an animal and even know that you're not missing most of it because simply they're using different, they're using different kinds of you know, ways of thinking. They have perspectives in their environment we can't imagine. I'll tell you one story that w was very telling to me. A couple of years ago, my, one of the doctoral students in my lab, Preston Furter, and I did a study at the Smithsonian's National Zoo with elephants. I joke about saying that I study big gray brains and big gray mammals, elephants and dolphins. And um, so we worked with elephants this time, not dolphins. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this study that was done many years ago by Wolfgang Kurler with showing the first evidence for insightful problem solving in chimpanzees. So insightful problem solving has been defined as having, being faced with a novel problem or situation and without trial and error thing, you come up with, you have sort of this aha moment and you see the solution suddenly, a sudden, you know, solution a reorganization of your thinking so you can solve this problem. So what Pimps is he uh, hung bananas high above their reach and he placed variety of objects in their environment. This was done at a zoo in Tenerife. And he gave them, there were some sticks and there were some boxes. And you know, the chimps, one of them's name was Sultan, you know, and I forget the names of the others, were looking up obviously couldn't reach it. And finally, one of the chimps, without trial and error, apparently, stacked the boxes, took a couple boxes, stacked them up, and, and then took a stick and was able to reach the banana. And that was sort of the first evidence that a non-human species showed this aha moment. They sort of got it. And I, we were really interested because there had been a lot of discussion about elephants being, elephants are big tool users. They're one of the biggest tool users, um, but somehow they weren't showing this kind of insightful problem solving when people gave them sticks to solve problems. So we went to Smithsonian's National Zoo and we simulated or replicated this curler experiment. We didn't hang bananas above their reach, but we strung up a sort of a clothesline out of wire and shot out um, tree limbs baited with tasty fruit that they would eat. What we did was we put boxes that they could, that they could stack and sticks and, and rods. Well, what we saw was that this elephant never picked up a stick again. He didn't bother. He could stick with his trunk and for it. He never did it. But what he 
was he went for the block, and he, which was much more effort, there was much more effort involved in this. He pushed the block right under, got up on the block, and got his trunk where the fruit was. And it, it was interesting, and he continued gave him repeated trials where we hid the block, we moved the block, he had a search for the block. Once he got it, he got it, he could solve the problem. But if we had only given him sticks, he may never have shown that. Well, let's think about this. So an elephant's trunk is a really cool sensory organ. First of all, they, they, their optimal vision, their best visual acuity is at the end of the trunk. They have two little points that we call fingers that can pick up something a dime so they can see, touch, smell with this great, it's not a tool because it's part of their body. And what they needed to do perhaps is get this cool sensory organ up where the food was. And the stick would have shut off their ability to touch the food, smell the object, and perhaps their visual acuity. Again, it was these past experiments where we only gave them sticks and they do. So again, I think there's a lesson to be learned in some of that. An elephant, if we can, if we're going to test them. But, yeah. well, I mean, we, we saw that with the pulling. So this is a study. This was developed by um, Bernd Heinrich for work with crows and ravens. And what you do is you have a perch, and you put a really long string with a tasty treat on the bottom. And he showed this to the ravens, and the ravens sort of flew over and looked at it and flew back and flew over and looked at it. And then again, without any trial and error, reached down, grabbed the the string with his beak, pulled it up, clumped his foot on it, and basically reeled it in. Crows weren't so good at this. So we thought, hey, we got these brilliant parrots. Let's try this. Well, it turned out that the parrots in our lab that had not yet learned to speak did extremely well on this. I mean, they looked at it. It took them, you know, 10 seconds or so. They figured it out. The ones that did speak, Alex and Griffin looked at it, looked at us, and went, Go pick up nut. <laughs> now, language as a tool. That's, language is a tool. But had we done it only with our older, more intelligent parrots, we would have said they can't figure out how to do the task. But it wasn't that they couldn't. It was like, that's not, uh, you know, we don't do physical work. You know, we know how to manipulate you to do it. Well, that actually reminds me a lot of the comparison between wolves and dogs, because on a string pulling task where um, a string, uh, researchers create this convoluted apparatus where there's essentially a ball that holds um, meat, and which can open the door. Um, and wolves and dogs will learn to pull the string to open the door. They both will use their mouth. But then they, the researchers make it an impossible task. In other words, they jimmy it so that it won't open if you pull the string. And wolves will go at this task you know, until they wreck the cage. You know, they'll go at it until they're from their gums. Dogs start to pull at it. It's not opening. They pull at it, and they stop and look at the handler or the person. <laughs> Uh, we are sort of the tool who solves the problem for the dogs. And the question is, which is more intelligent? The wolves with their persistence, that's useful in their environment, or the dogs with their using us, who have hands and brains which can solve that pro problem? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question. My question is this. If the dog, if the if the elephant has a certain kind of intelligence, if the dog has a certain kind of intelligence, humans, are they all limited, and why? Why is it that the human intelligence seems unlimited? Why has it grown to the point it's grown? So I have my own views on this, which I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll say a tiny bit about, but why wh is, the, is the intelligence that we see in elephants not gonna go beyond where it is? I, it's interesting, your example, Diana, because it's almost like the example with the elephant and the trunk is, is sort of an example of embodied cognition. We're applying the stick to an elephant, but it doesn't, it doesn't deal with sticks, whereas chimpanzees like sticks, you know. Um, humans just have... To, just to say one thing, they do use sticks as tools to rub themselves, to pry open things, oh, right, where right. they don't have to smell and get to them. But they, in this case, that, it actually. wouldn't, may, wouldn't yeah, yeah, yeah. necessarily wouldn't facilitate it. Sense, yeah. maybe. But what I want to know is, why is it that the, uh, the elephant intelligence doesn't go beyond that, and what happened to humans that somehow led beyond? I, I believe it's related to the physical design. I believe that the upright design was sort of the, kind of like a breakthrough design that allowed um, 
human intelligence to evolve in, in a completely different way and lead to an expansion of the brain, a whole set of different behaviors. But I wonder if the, if, uh, if the elephant design doesn't allow further f development in that direction. Oh Actually, I'd, I'd like to twitch it in a different way. I think symbolic representation is one of the critical issues here. Because we've, we've done some studies with our birds on competence. And by giving them, I mean, we, they don't the way you and I have language. I couldn't have put Alex on the table here and we couldn't have had the conversation we we're having, okay. But he had symbolic representation, and my other birds do too. And they can do numerical tasks that animals without symbolic representation cannot do at all, all right? And this seems to be an incredible difference. And of course, we've given these birds a symbolic representation. They, whatever symbolic representation they have in the wild seems to be much more limited, okay? But it's, that's to me seems to be an incredible difference. And to me, it seems to be that, that for humans, we've kind of ratcheted things up by using, you know, symbolics and then thinking things, using the symbols to think things through and then getting more complicated symbols, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I guess the, the question is when, when does a difference in quantity become a difference in quality? And, or does that ever happen? So, um, I mean, these, I, I don't think anybody would deny that human intelligence is in some ways further developed than virtually any other intelligence on the planet, maybe, um, or close to, or it's near the top, or whatever way you want to put it. Um, but, but is it different? Is it fundamentally different in some way, in this discontinuous way? Or are we just looking at a kind of a quantum leap, a gap? I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm personally, philosophically against the idea of a discontinuity because that magic sauce of some sort or another, special sauce that, that be, I mean, assuming we all believe that, that mentality of all sorts is basically physically embodied in this thing called the brain and the rest of the nervous system, then if you think human intelligence is different than other animals' intelligence, then it has to be because we have some special sauce, which I don't think is the case. So I'm a kind of a no miracles kind of person <laughs> in that sense. So it, so it can't be totally discontinuous, and yet you're absolutely right that you can't fool yourself into believing that it's perfectly continuous either in, in some just tiny incremental way. So it's an interesting question. I mean, where are the differences? And I think there are differences not only between, say, elephants and humans or chimps and humans or dolphins and humans, whatever you want to consider the next best thing to us or something like that in some scale, but there are differences all the way through the animal kingdom where there are these jumps <clears throat> that may look discontinuous but are not. They're just using the same stuff for different purposes, for new purposes, perhaps. Did you ever have, oh, I thought you were. Well, we do questions after. Oh, okay. I know. So, I guess they're different. is that? No, 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 no. Not yet, okay. Yeah, session. But that's a, what you are saying is uh, that human intelligence evolves, but that animal intelligence doesn't evolve. Am I? question correct that well, humans are more intelligent today than they were 5,000 years ago but the elephant is the same well that's hard to say we don't know that than 5,000 years ago um, but there's something that happened in the human design that led to such so many different faculties so many different faculties arose with hominids now you could say that that's part just a circumstance you have an animal that's upright <clears throat> capable of in a way that, you know, their forelimbs in a way that no other animal can. And all of a sudden, because of that, they were, you know, they were capable of new behaviors. And one of them is simply eating differently. Maybe that alone could account for the change in the size of the brain. And yet, the question I ask myself, just studying anatomy is, is an area that I'm interested in. I've been interested in it for a long time. What is, why is it that it seems that just being upright is associated with being more conscious? To me, there's some, so almost like a, like a qualitative uh, connection. I mean, you know, Jane Goodall used to say that she felt that chimpanzees were capable of uh, awe. Certain pretty unusual emotions, she said. She believed that. We, I'm not sure that's true. But she believed that a chimpanzee seen a new uh, beautiful setting that they could look and, and experience some kind of emotion. It seems to me that in primates something happened 
where going, the, the mere fact of being upright seems to decouple thinking from motor function. Not in the sense that Stuart and I were, uh, Stuart was mentioning how function is the basis of so much complexity in cognition. I agree. That motor function separates functionally, but it's as if in the human motor system, cognition begins to find a separate, a way of operating separately from motor action, so that as far as I know, I, and I could be wrong, I, I don't, I'm not an expert in animal uh, you know, cognition, but as far as I know, animals almost all, I, 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 could be, I could stand corrected just from what you said, Diana, but so many animals, when you see them thinking, their thinking is linked with movement. So a dog that sees prey, it may stop and look at the prey and lose interest and walk away. But even when it's stopped, it either loses interest or it's calculating how to get the prey. It never seems to move independently of the action. It's like it's one, one operating system. But a human being could do something, in my view, that's unique, whereas a human, which is a human being can sit and look at a piece of food and deliberate whether they want the food and say, oh, I'm not even sure. I, you think, it, okay, you're gonna say a bird can do it. Griffin passed the marshmallow test. Well, I wanna hear you know, it. Test. Yeah. Um, you know, waits 15 minutes. We can give him. He has a nut in front of him. We show him if you wait for the nut, wait, you'll get a skittle, which he loves much more. And I'll sit there for 15 minutes, and he does the same behavior patterns as the kids do. He pushes the nut away. He turns around. He starts preening so he doesn't have to look at it. He tries to fall asleep. I mean, he starts talking to himself and muttering things to himself and things. It's. You know, with a dog. I actually, well, no, I, but this, this was, was not trained. trained. Our dog, I have it on video. Our dog does it. We have a share a dog. Um, and our, we did this. I put a, a treat down there and I said, just stay. In a sense, training. And what, the videos you showed me, yeah. I mean, we didn't yeah. do a whole system yeah. out of big Newfoundland. And he's looking at it and he looks at me and he looks at the thing. He looks away. It's like, he looks, finally, he just, he's like, really, every finally leaves. And then he comes back and he, you know, similar kinds of things. We have interesting similar, these similarities in patterns. I think animals, you know, I think the constraint we have, thinking, I, mean, I do think they're thinking. About, I mean, we've, yeah. had, we've had situations where, okay, so this is, this is my like study. So he was trained to use the word none for the absence of similarity. So you could take any two things out of your pocket and say, what's same, what's different? And he'd say, color, shape, matter, or none, if nothing were same or different. So we're now doing a number comprehension study. He's already at the point where you can put a tray out with red and blue balls and blocks. So you've got four sets of things mixed in. You know, how many blue blocks? And I'll tell you. So now we've got to do comprehension. So there's three, four, and six things on the tray. And we've already had like a dozen trials where you say, you know, what? And he says blue, because the there are six blue blocks on the tray. So now I come in with, the three, with you know, this set of things. And I say, Alex, what color three? And he looks at me and he goes, five. There's no five things on the tray. Now, usually when he doesn't want to work, he takes his beak and whacks everything off on the floor or turns around and starts. But he's giving me a number, or he gives me all the wrong colors. So if the colors on the tray are red, blue, and green, he says purple, orange, and you know, yellow and stuff. So, but now he's giving me this number. So you know, what color three? Five. Finally, I go, OK, Smarty, what color five? And he looks at me and goes, none. So not only did he, you know, use none as a zero-like concept, which we in the West didn't do till the 1600s, but he figured out how to manipulate me into asking the question he wanted to answer. But he's using language. That's interesting. I mean, that, the, in that case, it seems like he's using language uh, in a meaningful yeah, way. I have to I have say just, this, oh, can I, just as a quick aside. Okay. Are you training this bird to be a synesthete? <laughs> 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 I mean, can you train synesthesia? <laughs> oh, I'm no, I'm just, I just wanted to follow up with something, because Irene, you, you also talked, told me these, some anecdotes. I mean, a lot of what happens to us is we see it, something happen once. And we replicate it. Yeah. You know. 
experiment. Inten yeah. But you told me a series of things similar to this, where you were te where you with Alex when he chewed up your paper and you yelled at him, and then can you talk to because this says a lot. It's I mean, similar to what well, you just talked he had, about. He had actually I'd gone out of the room. And he had dropped a, I think this is the sorry one, okay. So he had c managed to climb off his perch and he smashed a coffee cup. And I come back into the room and there is this bird in this midst of shattered crockery. And like, I have to say, I, I was really careful not to anthropomorphize and to, to try to be a scientist, but I come in and it's this instinct of going, <gasps> You know, the danger thing. If you came into your, the room and you saw your child on the floor with shattered crockery saying, how could you do that? Oh, you know, da, 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 da. And, you start, and then all of a sudden you realize, you know, this is not useful. So I, and I realize yeah, he's, bird, you're, and not just I'm trying to do bird, he's scared because this thing has been made a huge noise and there's all this stuff around here. And he's looking at me and I pick him and I say, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. You know, and then he learned to use this, there was no contrition necessarily, but he figured out that if he said, if he was being yelled at for something, and he said, I'm sorry, in this little pathetic voice, it completely, you know, took down our anger levels. So it was again a way of learning how to manipulate us using speech. He, he may not yeah. know what it means, but well, how many of you? And others who, you know, say I'm sorry all the time and there's no contrition, so, you know, I mean. You know, with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I wanted to kind of uh, attach to that a little bit, which was the study I did on dogs and whether they have, a, um, or, well, they do have a guilty look, but whether it indicates that they experience guilt. But to me, it highlights an interesting kind of tension that is, uh, this is coming up here, which is, do they have some emotional experience which indicates that they have a complexity of mind that we do and are maybe ruminating on what's been about to happen or did happen? Or are they just an instinctive actor? Or is there some manipulation going on? Like, and so in the study that I did, I just looked at whether this guilty look that dogs show, which is, you know, you might you have a dog, right? If with the head down and the tail under, maybe moving away from you actually indicates that they're experiencing something like guilt or whether it arises from some prompt. And so I, I asked, um, I went to owners' homes, which is a really nice thing about dealing with dogs instead of um, elephants. And uh, I asked the owners involved in the study and they put a little treat in front of their dog, told their dog not to eat it, left the room. Um, and we just sort of saw what happened next. Um, if they ate the treat, I called the owners back in the room and said they ate it and they were asked to scold their dogs. If they didn't eat the treat, I called the owners back in the room and I said they were obedient and they just greet their dogs happily like you do when you come back from the other room. But of course, it's a psychologist. I misled the owners in half the trial. So sometimes when the dog was obedient, I said actually they ate the treat and so they'd be scolded. It was very deceptive. And sometimes when the dog was disobedient, <laughs> sometimes when the dog was disobedient, it, they got away with it. I said they didn't eat the treat, and so they were greeted. And then I just you know, taped how much, what the dog was doing each of these conditions. And what was clear, 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 is that they showed guilty look, you know, a little bit of guilty look all the time, but they showed most guilty look um, not when they were actually guilty of having disobeyed their owner and eating the treat. It was when the owner scolded them. You could say a lot of things about that. You could say dogs don't feel guilt. I don't think I can say that based on that. But certainly, when we think, based on that look, that we're getting some access into their minds, that seems to be a disconnect. On the other hand, what is that reaction? It's probably a reaction to unlearned behavior, kind of like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to avoid punishment by the owner. So is that kind of more intelligent? Is it more clever? Is it, it certainly, is it less like us? I don't know, we're manipulative as well. You have, right? you have the, you know, the tail head. Okay, I'll tell the fish story. Yes. This is like the big fish story. So um, I, was, I was a graduate student, I was doing my PhD and I was working with this young dolphin who I was asked, I was asked to teach her to station, which means the dolphin stays in front of you as long as you have a bucket on the side of a pool. I've been caught from the wild, which I, I'm saying this publicly, we shouldn't be taking dolphins and whales from the wild, okay? This was a long time ago when people still did it. 
and um, she was a young dolphin, and I had to teach her to station. So I'm, I, I'm handed these big mackerels to, to mackerel fish, which are like this big, the dolphin's head's this big, and I cut the fish up into three sections, heads, middles, and tails. They, it would be easier for her to eat, and it would give me more fish to work with. And she ate the heads, she ate the middle sections, she spit out every tail I gave her. So I looked at it, I thought, well, maybe it's the fins that are, you know, she doesn't like. So I cut the fins off, I fed her the fish, and she ate everything, so I, I make the joke, who trained who here? You know, she's now trained me to prepare her fish. Anyway smart dolphin and she had learned to station within a day or so and I'm feeding her and everything's fine but in the course of me training her to station if she didn't stay with me I would use a correction procedure pool 10 to 15 feet and I just stand there and stare at her and she'd watch me that was my way of letting her know she did the wrong thing it was breaking social contact and she couldn't get I'd come back it seemed to work and she learned to stay if she didn't want me to back up Everything's going fine. It's two or three or four days down the line. And by this time now, I throw her. She's stationing perfectly. One day I threw her an uncooked steak. She looks up at me. She spits the fish out. And she makes a beeline for the other side of the pool and takes a horizontal position and just stands there. <laughs> right? And I'm thinking, can, can this possibly be very much like what you talked about with Alex? And I'm thinking, is she really using this timeout back on me? It was a timeout. I forgot to tell you that. So now this is an anecdote, and you're not going to write this one up in a paper. And I was working on my doctoral thesis at the time. And I, so I thought, but wait a minute. Maybe I can make this into an experiment. So what I did was I was really careful over the next couple of sessions to cut all the fish right. And she stayed with me the whole time. But then a couple days later, on purpose, I gave her another uncut tail to see. And don't you know it, bum, across the side of the pool, she does the time out again. And she did this on three other occasions over the course of the next weeks. I love this story because, first of all, it the dolphin gave me. She was a complete collaborator on this. And it just goes to show you, to me, what's the essence of communication and how it develops. And as a graduate student, that was my field, bioacoustics and communication, is when children learn, when we're, ex when we're interacting, at home or animals that we're working with in, in labs or the field, there's this mutual synthesis of behavior, synchrony of behavior. We don't know what the other is, what, what's in the head of another. You open any communication textbook, there, the meaning is not in the message. It's in our interpretation. And what true communication in my mind is about is how we synchronize our behavior patterns, how it functions. I'll give you one more example. Um, Gregory Bateson, many of you have heard of Gregory Bateson, a communication theorist. He talked about the fact that his son and his wife and he, I think it was Margaret Mead he was married to at the time, traveled to South America. His child didn't know any Spanish and they were unpacking their luggage and his child went out onto the street and he and his wife look out on the street. They're amazed to see their kid playing kickball or football in the street. And every so often they hear him yelling, aki, aki, and the ball gets thrown to the child. And, you know, he's using it. And the kid comes back up into the, the hotel room. And Bateson says, learn that so fast. How did you learn what a key meant? And he goes, I don't know what it meant. I just saw how it worked. When anybody yelled a key, they got the ball. And I think that's very much what Circe did. She learned the function. And I think that is really how we start to communicate. And I think, Alex, I mean, I'm, when you probably talk to people about their dogs and ask how many of you think they're communicating, they say, yeah, we communicate with our pets because we do. They're learning our patterns, we're learning their patterns. It may not mean the same thing, but there's some organization and pattern behavior that develops, so. I just wanted to go back, if it's okay, for a moment to the question that, that Ed asked of, of you and, and, your, and your idea that, that you and somehow or another have developed a, a different kind of, a, a more advanced kind of intelligence and whether or not we would think that was true of humans 5,000 years ago, whether they were smarter. And I th I'd like to suggest that actually if Alex is the parrot, if Alex has children, are, are the children smarter than other parrots? Well, he didn't have children. <laughs> um, and what happened was he, when we had another little bird in the lab, he was so aggressive that he ate this little bird and interrupt all of his sessions. You know, he, Griffin learned some things from Alex, but. Alex did not want to teach him. It was only towards the end of his life that we figured out how to Alex to see that he would get a lot more attention if he 
helped teach Griffin, but that was the end of his life. But, um, you know, the, I mean... I'm sorry. Go on, go on. But it's an, it's an interesting question. And the funny thing is, is that we now have a little female, so there's no aggression. And that was one of the reasons we got a female, to see if Griffin's going to teach her. Your question, I think, if we look across other animal societies, like elephants, dolphins, um, dogs, I'm sure, as well, many animals, dolphins, um, we see that there is what we think is evi growing evidence for cultural transmission. And, but yeah, but, but learning through observation. What, what are you talking about? I'm actually, <laughs> this is sort of, in spite of cultural transmission, I mean, I think... Ted, I think if you were here 5,000 years ago, you would have the same low opinion of humans that you have of elephants. Because for 5,000 years, they frickin' did nothing, frankly. I mean, the Bronze Age went on for 2,000 years. 50 generations were born, grew up, and died in precisely the same technology. I mean, it's not like it is today. Today is different, I agree. Since the Enlightenment, something has changed, but that can't clearly be evolution because there's not enough time. I mean, now, if you go away for a holiday for two weeks, you come back and your operating system's out of date. <laughs> I don't know, everything is wrong. You're not like part of it anymore, you know? You're hopelessly behind. But I mean, there were long, long stretches of time while we were upright and had this very same brain we had now when kind of nothing much happened, when we didn't really develop anything of any particular value and just kept beating the crap out of each other in little trots. We still do. In fact, so. <laughs> but it is an interesting issue, is why us? Why us with technology? What that's stopped, true, uh, that, yeah. That's a discontinuity, mm -hmm. I agree. But it's not an one or a physical one, or maybe even <clears throat> one of cognition. I mean, it, it's a discontinuity of, I don't know, it's a certain kind of thinking that may have been quite accidental. It's not as though science a bunch of times and then petered out. The Greeks had science. But then it kind of stopped after all. The Arabs had a very, you know, flourishing science, and it kind of didn't, didn't continue in a way. So, so far, we have one that continues, and I think that's in many ways what we refer to when we, I mean, not just science, physics, and all that, but a scientific frame of mind is what we refer to as a kind of a modern mind. And to me, that is different, and that's what gives us, I think, the impression that we're different than so many other animals or co-inhabitants. Think about the, the fossil record for certain other species. I'm only going to talk about dolphins. It's the only one I really feel comfortable talking about that I know anything about. But you know, there's evidence that over time, uh, their brains got larger and the bodies remained somewhat smaller. So brain size has increased. There's always the constraint, dolphins, cetaceans, dolphins and whales. There's always the constraint of, with mammals, they have to be able to pa pass through a pelvic bone. But the brains ha are large and complex, and they've increased in size over time. So that's interesting. Again, they can, those, they, those brains, you know, the overall bodies of these guys are pretty big, and they're in an aquatic environment, so perhaps there are less constraints that way. And then also you have arguments that, depending on the, the um, that, a, that animals have. For example, elephants and dolphins have been, and humans are considered by many, show the highest levels of there's some papers that have come out recently. And some of that's really been attributed to um, in these groups and things like that. So there are all sorts of different ways of thinking about intelligence and how we measure it. And and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Ed, go ahead. I, I'm, I am on the fact that I, I don't, maybe I just disagree with everyone else here that, we, that there is just like a linear progression that man is at, humans are at the acme. I just, I actually don't believe that. I mean, I don't... I'm, do you feel there is a it, as opposed, to, I don't necessarily mean there have to be multiple intelligences. I don't, I'm not sure that I love the word intelligence to describe what any animal is doing, including the human animal. But I, I'm, I guess I'm more ethologically driven. I'm interested in how the animal is fitting into its environment. And if the question is, maybe it's about success, you know, I mean, are humans going to survive for, I don't know if we're going to survive for another 150 years, but there might be plenty of animals who do. So are they then the, the acme of biological, you know, of, of neural, neurally founded organisms? To me, I'm st I feel like it's a very... Sometimes your squirrels, you know, get through the bird feeder that you've tried every right. single yeah. conceivable way of, you know... Yeah. <laughs> type of thing than we see other animals doing. So there are things which we seem to do alone. That, that I absolutely assent to. But I find the kind of complexities of other animals' behavior to be 
as radical. And the fact that we can't go into their minds and say what they're doing in those moments when they seem to be doing nothing doesn't mean to me that they're doing nothing. It seems to me that we don't know what they're doing, which is a fault of our mind, not of theirs. I'm, kind just, of. I'm just trying to understand. I thought, you, I thought a moment ago you didn't agree with that you felt that there was a discontinuity. Now, now it sounds like I'm, I'm not clear. I think, it's weird, I think it's an odd um, way to pose the whole structure. Is that there either has to be a continu continuum or not because we're at the top of it, right? Like that there's some progression of sophistication of cognition. And then the question you seem to be asking is how do we get to the very top of that? What, is it through some radical thing that yeah. happened or yeah. is it sort of through small changes. Yeah, sure. And I'm saying, so I don't think we're up at the top right. at all. Like, I think it's sort of messier yeah, right than that. Yeah. Because that's the wrong, that's I mean, right. that's also, we now know that's the completely wrong way to think of evolution. I mean, evolution is not a pyramid. <laughs> it's a bush, it's a that's tree, right. and there's a plurality. Of, and every, every creature that currently exists is at the top of the evolutionary branch that of it sits there. upon. Yeah. And so, but it's only, I think you're absolutely right, it's only when it comes to mentality or cognition that we insist on this more linear idea that continuity no longer means a tree, which is also, I mean, we believe in evolutionary continuity, but it no longer means a plurality of continuities. It means a single one, a single line. Here's the dumbest thing and we're the smartest thing and then everybody has some place along the line, which I think is completely yeah, wrong. Not, that we do. I mean, you know, you, what did you say, 90 million years for the dolphin 95. human split? 95? Okay. 280 million for the parrots versus, you know, our last common ancestor was the dinosaurs 280 million years ago. I mean, yet, you know, I've got this bird that's doing the same thing a five-year-old can do. Okay? I mean, you know, and again, we don't know some things that so they're... why do you have to get into what a five-year-old can do, and it didn't develop itself the ability to do what a five-year-old can do. Because I gave it, I gave it a symbolic representation, which is what you give your five-year-old too. I mean, olds just don't, you know, you don't put the five-year-olds in a cage and say, "Here's some food and treats, and I'll come back in five years and see what you've done." Um, you know, I mean, we give it a symbolic well, how representation. Come we gave our five-year-old representations and parrots didn't. Well, we don't, you know, the interesting thing is with all of these animals is that we are just beginning to understand their communication systems. And that's a whole nother, totally nother game plan here is that, I mean, we've been, you know, for bird song, we've been studying bird song since the 60s. And we're just now, because we got so much better equipment, okay, being able to start to tee, just really start to tease apart what they're doing when they're sitting out there, you know, it sounds like just pretty song to us, but we're beginning to learn that there's so much more complexity. Each song has a different, I don't want to say exactly meaning, because then you think of it as, as meaning like, a, like our language, but each song has a different effect on the recipient. And the recipient responds in a different way depending on which song it's heard. I mean, there used to call it marsh wren poker, okay? Because the bird would, each bird has like 50 songs and they have them in different orders. And the birds know not only their 50 songs orders, but their neighbor's 50 songs orders. And they'll match them and raise them one, okay? So, you know, you, you sing your 47 and I'll go, I'm going to sing your 48, but that's my 32. But I know it's your 48, so I'm going to match you and raise you one <laughs> to tell you that I want, you know, your, your elbow is getting too close into my territory here. I mean, these are things we're just beginning to learn. So I'm, I'm never going to argue that their communication systems are as rich and as varied as ours. I'm, at this point, it's not clear that they can sit there and tell you what they did yesterday, okay? <laughs> right, depends on us too. But um, but but the issue is that it, it is it is more complicated than we thought. And I don't think the one thing I'm sure of is that I couldn't have mapped whatever English I did onto his abilities if there wasn't some basic cognitive architecture there. I mean, if he didn't have some kind of innate innate quote unquote sense of same and different, I couldn't have mapped. English terms of same and different onto it. And that's a really critical point. I'm sort of saying, you know, again, we're pretty blind and deaf to what they can do. We can't decode. We don't have that magic decoder thing with these guys. Yeah. 
Right. I mean, we have the sen our scent system compared to a dog's. There's like we're such primitive idiots. I mean. So, so I mean, the problem comes down to one of them. Sort of a something that we would all claim that we're against, but which we're all participating in if we're not careful, which is a kind of an anthropocentrism, right? Anthropocentrism doesn't doesn't give other creatures human-like qualities. It's just the opposite. It uses humans as the only way to measure anything. Right. right. So Instead of looking at a plurality of cognitive abilities, a plurality of cognitions, a plurality of consciousness, the, all the things brain tissue can do in whatever vehicle it happens to be running in, that seems to me to be a much more interesting kind of pursuit than worrying about how to classify this stuff in, on, a, on a scale in which humans, you know, sort of denote the top level, some bug, the bottom. Something it's a like pity that. we don't have an octopus. Okay, but let me, let yeah. me, I want to say something to challenge this idea. <laughs> because I don't, the reason why, the, apart from the question of what's actually true about what happens in human evolution, I've had the experience very often when I, let's say, give a talk on anatomy, when I, someone speaks up in a group and says, you know, um, we're really, uh, we're really not, I've had people say this to me in a group, in a, in a, in a seminar, we're really not like monkeys, you know, we really have no connection to monkeys. And it turns out that they have very religious, creationist kind of view. People will often side with Darwin, say, and, and very, you know, sort of come up to me later on and say, you know, wow, we don't believe in that. We're than animals, we're part of the animal kingdom. But I've also had the experience on the flip side that if I say to a group of people, you don't really think that the law of natural selection explains what's happened with the emergence of complex life forms, particularly the human life form, which, by the way, I have no trouble at all is unique for various And I think in a way that we don't understand birds, I don't think we understand all the human faculties either. But when I say that flip side of it, people will often say, you're right, I don't believe it. And I found that to be the same, the same group will go both ways. In other words, our, our lived beliefs are often don't reflect our intellectual beliefs. Our intellectual belief in natural selection is often not people's lived belief. And I want to know why, because the fact is that we all, why is it that, yes, I agree, birds uh, can do things we didn't dream of 100 years ago, but why is it that that a six-year-old can often outstrip what any bird can do. Why? What happened in humans to make them so smart? What? You can't six yeah, can't can't fly, so no, can't well, I'm not. I'm not. When I say this, I don't. And, well, six, and birds can do things that six-year-olds well, yeah, cannot yeah. do. Beyond to, flying. Yeah, I don't mean to say that. When so I say this, I don't mean yeah. to say that humans are better in every respect than animals. I'm not. That's not my point of view. I mean, there. I mean, Darwin remarked that the the instincts of bees were as wonderful as human intelligence. That comment. He say he was Darwin loved the animal kingdom. He 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 sort of almost worshipped it. I agree with that. I think cats. We have three cats, and I think they're un unbelievable. And they are they're far more sensitive in my home in many ways. So I'm not saying humans are just somehow better in every respect. But with respect to the question of decoupled cognitive something has happened in humans that hasn't happened with any other species. And my question is, why? Does nothing explain it? I think it only explains a part of it. It can't explain all of it. And one of the reasons why natural selection can't explain all of it is because natural selection as a proposition already presupposes life. And a proposition that includes something like, in this case, life, as part of the proposition can't explain something presupposed in the problem. Natural selection sounds like an abstract principle, but it isn't. It's a principle that says, hey, if they're, if they're a mating pair of birds that create, that create you know, four birds every year, and the population of birds in a given area, assuming there are no incoming and outgoing birds, remains the same, that means every year two out of four of the birds are dying. Why? It's just a simple randomness principle that you know, the ones that are let fit for their environment die, and the ones that are slightly more, it's a randomness principle. But it presupposes life, and life is already moving toward a higher organization. No, the no, question no, no. is That's why. That's completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm sorry. So one of the things that evolution well, and natural selection. Is, before, before you answer, 
I, I would like to hear from everyone on this question, not just told them wrong, okay? Okay. So I would just say that I think one of the, one of the common errors about evolution and natural selection is that it's an optimization procedure, that it's optimizing everything that the, that's the best that there is and will continue to improve, that, it, that it's an improvement program, and that's just simply not the case. That's why 99.9% .9 of the species that have ever existed on the planet are currently extinct. So it's not very good at optimizing at all. There's an old joke about this, which is a science joke, so it's not going to be funny, so don't, <laughs> don't plan on laughing or anything. But two scientists are out camping one night in the woods, you know, and the, it's late at night, and all of a sudden a bear begins to sort of attack the tent and rattle the tent all that night. Both jump up, what are we going to do? And one of them starts putting his sneakers on, tying his sneakers on. The other one says, what are you tying your sneakers on for? You can't outrun a bear. And he says, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> So, you know, right? So evolution is only optimized just to outrun each other, so the other guy is the meal, not the eater of the, of the person. So, so, yeah, this is a better joke than I thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't make it up. So, um, so, so I think that, so I think you will, I, I just think you have to be careful not to get on the. So I, in some ways, agree with you. A, I didn't say evolution is optimizing anything. I, no, in fact, well, you might you, even have you, a better species than humans that doesn't get selected next year. I mean, theoretically, because natural selection doesn't allow. Natural selection as a principle isn't operating. I'm saying it doesn't explain the whole question of how life. I, I agree with you because it's not an optimization thing. It has nothing to do with optimization. Right. I mean, the fact that we're able to have this round table and smart enough to talk and all the rest of this kind of stuff, it could just be some, probably likely is for sure, some huge accident. It's a good one so far. I mean, we don't really know how well it's going to work. Or, I mean, surely we'll be extinct one day. Everything else is. Why wouldn't we be? So I'm, I'm just suggesting, in some ways, I'm actually supporting what you're saying. I wouldn't use evolution to explain a scale of intelligence. I wouldn't use it, actually, to explain a scale of anything. So in that sense, I agree with you. I just, no, so I think it's a straw no man, I guess. arrow well. direction evolution, yes. or there is? Yes, so right. what's the purpose of no that arrow. arrow direction? Oh, there is, there no, is arrow. no arrow of direction. So I'm saying it's a I'm sort of a straw man arrow. argument. That's all I'm, I'm my only I'm, point is I don't I'm, believe evolution has an arrow either, but I believe life itself pushes toward organization. And I know that's controversial, but the fact is that when you allow people to say, well, you know, it does kind of appeal, it, this isn't, species don't disappear. There have been other, there, there seems to have been a species, an upright hominid that had a larger brain than us, that didn't make it. So it's not as if some animal was meant to appear. I'm not even su suggesting that. It does, it, everything we've talked about is based on vertebrates, I mean, most of our discussion. And why is it that vertebrates go, go to... No, I know, I'm not, I, cephalopods are amazing, but cephalopods are, are not going to go past the design template that, that's allowed them. I think some cephalopods appear to be incredibly smart in ways that we... I don't think we should eat oct an octopus. I think they seem to me to be too smart. And I don't like to eat animals that are that smart. Um, but... I, but they have a design that isn't going is, isn't to go past the, what their design allows. In the same way, I think, that a bird design can't go past what a bird design Wait, allows. Well, how but can you say yeah. that you don't know where this design is going to go? Yeah. Well, they've been, because it's not, it, as far as I can tell, I mean, I'm no ex expert on, on an octopus, but as far as I know, uh, design can't, it can't morph, it can't somehow get bones. We haven't seen an octopus appear. Didn't we come what out of the mean? water, basically? Well, no. What do we look like in the water? No, but an octopus has gone in a particular line of evolution. It can't go so backwards far. and pick up bones. I'm just saying. No, but I don't. I don't. Yeah, I disagree. I don't think that's the case. I mean, it, certainly it's been for quite a period of time. But there's nothing that foundationally, biologically, is against it. It evolving into something slightly different. That are there. That you know, there's a there's a pile of sits around and will only get ex, you know expressed under certain conditions. I mean, it's the it's the it's the the Darwin's finches things where you start switching things around and then they'll change and I mean, back and forth. I mean, the octopi that actually walk sometimes on two of their you know 
legs, arms, and you could see bipedal. where bipedal, and you could see under certain circumstances that could be selected for. There might be advantages and things. I mean, I, I think we have to be really careful about saying where animals can, how they can or cannot change, and the whole epigenetic thing. What it looks like in the case of human cognition or human mental abilities is there's something, something has gone faster than you could explain by evolution. Something has developed that you can't simply use an evolution for because been enough time in a way. And I, I mean, I agree with you. I'm, my only concern is I I'm feel like it's a straw man I'm argument. I'm not quite saying that. I'm saying that a natural selection alone doesn't explain it. Yeah, I also, selection, but, a, so I was a little concerned. So what do you mean by life tries to get better or so? What did you I say exactly? Say what, what did you say <laughs> exactly about living matter does something? You, it, it sounded like it had a point to it. Well, verte <laughs> well you know, we, we, I, it sounds nice when you're using a, when we speak, when we talk the language of science, it sounds, you know, we have a sort of seem to have a preference for sort of arguments about randomness or, and we tend to get cynical and say, well, human beings at 30, everything deteriorates. Uh, you know, we're not really meant to be here. Uh, we're, we're sort of meant to die off and we keep our old elders alive because it seems more civilized. And it's sort of the cynical language. I don't think that's really what, what's going on with humans. I, I think with verte vertebrates are what they are, and intelligence has developed because they express a level of complexity that you don't find in other animals. I mean, an animal with, a, with an external skeleton can't, uh, I, I'm, again, I'm no expert on insects, but an animal with an exoskeleton d sort of is a, a dead end in, in terms of design, but the vertebrate design was so f with the internal skeleton, the internal skeleton, the musculature on the outside going onto land, such a flexible design that it allowed a whole, you know, like a book of marvels. It allowed all these different animals to emerge, which we're looking at, and we're one of them. Um, and that is based on the complex, multi celled uh, design that we have. How does life push in that direction? Why does it push in that direction? It's got organization. Life, we haven't understood what makes life what it is. And one of the properties seems to me is that it, it is self-organizing. And it puts different ways of organizing itself. I and I know scientists don't like I that. But. Um, that I can't really understand as a, as a useful explanation. Well, it's, it's, I, I just can't but understand it as a useful a explanation. It looks that way. Yeah, but you don't defy the second law of thermodynamics. I don't care who you are. <laughs> I don't care how, you, how great you think we are. Not the second law of thermodynamics, I'm sorry. What's remarkable about us is that we figured out there's a second law of thermodynamics. That I will admit to you, that's one of the most remarkable mentation I've, I can ever imagine. But, but you don't get away with it. That's like biblical, second law of thermodynamics. You know, you don't mess with that. I, I just don't think there's any indication that we ever get away with it. I, why, if, if life is, if there's only entropy, if things are only, how is it that we're all sitting here and can maintain our organized life forms in such a high level, because even... we're using up the planet to do it. <laughs> That's how we do it. We may, use up perhaps, the planet, which perhaps, is fine. I'm not even against perhaps. that necessarily. <laughs> but, you know, well, I mean, within reason, I suppose. But... But in point of fact, that's how we do it, just you know. Over the course of our life, and the species itself could fall apart. I mean, we're just we're just a snapshot. I feel like we're very focused in our we're very provincial in our looking. I mean, of course, we're going to be anthropocentric. We're anthros, yeah. like that's. So I think the only thing we can do is be. Aware. But also, the temporal provinciality, like we hear and we see. You know, we know what's happening right then and maybe what happened yesterday. I mean, actually, that is very narrow. And what is actually happening in the species or what's actually the case with our species, I think is very hard to say. I don't, I don't want to say it. You know, I think we are probably. I, I'm more of a believer in physics than biology there. We're falling apart. <laughs> Yeah. Falling yeah. apart. When I say there's organization, I see some people nodding, and when I say there's disorganization, some people. <laughs> Interesting sort of um, area of of psychology, which I don't know that much about, but it really is again a dependent thing, which means the way you phrase a particular question affects the kind of answer you get. And I'm wondering if we're dancing around that a little bit, too. 
so that there's certain ways you say, well, you know, would you, would, it's a study about, it says, you know, there's a certain amount of for doing something, you probably know this better than I, and it's like you can say it, it's that 50% of the people will get this disease, or you could say so many people out of a certain number will get this disease, and if you phrase it one way, it's much more positive than the other. You, you, you probably can... can Twain thing about there being liars, damn liars, and statisticians. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's, this whole, it's an entire yeah. subset of psychology that basically, and the, what do you think, in Madison Avenue certainly takes advantage of it. Um, so that there are, there are ways of phrasing certain types of questions, and you have to be very careful about that, too. Well, yes, I mean, I, I think the, the danger, I think of what Alexandra is saying, is that, that we, ha we are trapped, if we're not very careful, in a fairly parochial view of things that's very local. And it's very hard. I mean, this is why pseudoscience is so, uh, it gets purchased so easily, because it's very hard not to look. I mean, there's a great story by uh, Wittgenstein, who apparently at some point was walking with a friend and said, you know, it's always amazing people so long to figure out that the earth is rotating and the sun is standing still. And his friend said, well, but Ludwig, you know, it looks that way, doesn't it? And Wittgenstein said, because what would it look like if the earth were rotating and the sun were standing still? It looks like what it is, you know. But it does just look that way. And indeed, uh, it's still very hard to figure out why it is the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour and the, the birds in the clouds aren't being left behind. I mean, really, most people could not tell you how that is. I'm <laughs> not so sure I could in a way that you would believe me. So, so, but it's very easy to have these, I mean, we still all live in a pre-Copernican world. We're real smart folks sitting in this room and we say, what time is the sun setting? Well, the sun's not setting and it's not, you know, but that's the way it and, and that's the way it goes, you know. And we live in a Newtonian world and that's not true either, really, but it serves our purposes. But, but you can have these parochial views and believe there's a lot of truth in them. And I think that's a potential danger. You have to be careful. You do have to try and expand it a bit, as much as you possibly can, it seems to me. I'm thinking, too, about how, we're, how we talk about our subject. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we do, who's, who, are, who are studying animals, is give examples of animals doing something which seems to us who uh, is evidence of a kind of cognition. Um, and then maybe somebody will give a counterexample of a person doing something like that. And I, and that's also a way of defining our terms. I mean, we're trying to just get traction and to get any funding or anybody to take you seriously when you're dealing with the non-human animals. That's part of it. But also, what if we all just talked about the mistakes that we see animals make or the mistakes that humans make and had that be defining of what the species were? It, you know, we would look very different as people as opposed to looking at our high achievements and being so impressed by our high achievements. Probably I'm thinking about all the mistakes I've recently made, you know, <laughs> or at that, is, would that be defining of who, of, of me as a human being, as a member of the species, would that be any more indicative, maybe, of what the human is? Human species, and we talk about, well, you know, no animal is, you know, a pa Picasso or a Beethoven or an Einstein, but there's only been a Picasso, and, you know, I mean, the thing is, we look at, at these exceptional individuals, and we say, well, humans are capable of this because one or two of these, you know, individuals have done this. But the average person on the street, I mean, you know, I, I can't, can barely carry a tune, much less, you know, do what Beethoven did. Um, so, again, we also have to think about it in those ways that we, we put ourselves on this pinnacle. And also, being in academia, you know, there's even a stronger chance of this because we hang out with all these elites and, and stuff. So this is another thing that we have to think about, too. I mean, even the psych studies, we talk about now that the students being weird, you know, upper educated, you know, I mean, it's like we're all, all the studies we do on, in psychology, they're all on, you know, college sophomores, okay? And we try to claim that this is representative of the human race. I mean, this is insane. You know, I think, I think I, one of the themes, I think, that's emerging, or it's, it's this conversation from the idea of plurality and different ways of thinking is, you know, again, we're the ones talking about it. A, a really broad look, and you look at insect societies, you look at, I'll just, I, I keep bringing up dolphins just because I study them. These are societies, and they're in, in every, every way. And you look at a dolphin society, they, they have not altered their environment much. They 
it, but their bodies have changed morphologically. They've got they've radically streamlined, radically streamlined to adapt to their environment, and beautifully so. Continue to change, obviously, as we've seen. And they find ways to co coordinate their behavior. They they show ex exquisite complex complexity, and they're not destroying their environment. So you know, again, this sort of gets back to you. Big brains taking care of their cooperating, helping others. I mean, that's pretty cool in, term, in my book about what, uh, what is sort of evolved. And it just hasn't, been, hasn't evolved in our way. We have, we've taken another route and we're facing a lot of problems now. Dolphins may be facing other problems we're unaware of. But um, again, I think we have- Extreme example, Mark Moffat, who's an uh, uh, entomologist, a specialist in, have you ever had him at one of these things? You should have Mark Moffat. Yeah, well, I'll get, I'll get him to come over here. He's busy with his ants all the time. But, but Mark points out that there are really only two species on the planet that live in societies that number into the millions and that are willing to live in a society in which they don't pretty much know within one or two degrees of separation at least everybody in the society. They don't live with strangers. So chimp troops and things like that all number under 100. The only two species that are willing to live in vast numbers with strangers all around them. I mean, it's bizarre. We're sitting in a room like full of strangers here, right? So, and it's just us and ants. And only certain species will live in these huge colonies where they just, there's no way they know everybody. But they do it. They're fine with it. And us. Weird, huh? I don't know. Makes you feel creepy, doesn't it? <laughs> reasons why I originally uh, brought this subject up with Diana and then you, Stuart, and, and I think um, I think you were also there when we first discussed this, uh, was I was looking at it the other way around. We focused on what animals can do and animals or uh, intelligence and their ability to learn and so on. Uh, I was also interested the other because with my background in psychoanalysis, so my focus has always been the mind. It has not been on in what ways a lot of things contribute uh, motivation to are really biologically determined just as they are in animals. And so uh, a lot of things we do very similar to what you said. A newborn turns towards the mother's breast and sucks on the breast. And in psychoanalysis, there is an idea that from Freud that the, this is, a, is the beginning of psychosexual development and there's pleasure attached to it and so on. And so animals do it too. Uh, so my question is, and, and I wonder if you can say something a little bit about, more about that. This excessive focus on the mind in understanding people's behavior is incomplete. And how would understanding animals' behavior more help us understand more human behavior? Can I raise my hand on that one? Uh, so this is something I find really interesting, particularly when we get in, in the area of sociosexual behavior in humans and other animals. Obviously, we're a lot more tolerant in our society now than we were before. You look at, a, you look at other animals like bonobos, which are fairly, very sophisticated primates and dolphins, um, and you look at the development of sexual behavior. So you look at the development of what we call sociosexual behavior. So I'll give you the shortest possible story here. So we had we had studied um, two mothers and their calves in a facility. What you see is that what looks to be the adult sexual behavior pattern, and much of social behavior develops in the, with mothers and infants. They are stimulating their babies. They are uh, nursing their babies of the ventrum um, solicits a baby. There may be some we don't know where the baby looks, starts nursing on creases, the mother tends to direct it. Then the mother is also stimulating the beak genital area of the ba with her beak, the genital area, that again. And then you see these chases that ensue. The baby sprints off from the mother, the mother's chasing the baby. And as I was watching this, I, I was looking, I'm saying, I'm seeing this, the, the courtship behavior pattern in adults in the mother pattern. 
And I found it fascinating because, again, when you think about the roots of sociality and sexuality, it may come from these very early interactions. And then we saw these two young people had shown these interactions with their mothers. Now, in their first months, that's how they start interacting. That's what they know solicits. And you see this in the wild. It's not just in a captive situation. We obviously want to keep looking. But I think there's a great deal that can be learned about the nature of what, again, the sociosexual behavior. So here, so you look at male dolphins. And people who don't know about dolphins say, oh, they're, uh, they're gay or they're, you know, they're homosexual. They're not. They're interacting socially. That is their behavior. When females are stress and start soliciting, they, it becomes reproductive behavior. And I think it sort of broadens our view of, of these big-brained animals, and I think in our own species, sort of take away you know, the, the biblical underpinnings of what we should be doing and what we shouldn't, I think that may be a much more natural state. We see with bonobo societies a great deal of behavior, with penguins. I mean, there, it's a, we see much more sociosexual behavior in the animal world, um, and humans are part of the animal world. So an eye-opener. A lot of things that we assume we are deciding to act in a certain way or do certain things are in fact biologically determined. It's not no, like well, deciding. Well, it's a different no. meeting. No, no, but it's a different panel. You're no. on the wrong panel. <laughs> no, but what I'm trying to say is that there are certain uh, that we assume we are an agent in, that we really are simply repeating what. One of many. Yeah, I'm guessing about 98 percent of the things we do mm -hmm. are not. But that's yes. So Franz Duval is going to be speaking next week at the American Museum and doing a great talk on empathy. You know. I'd like also that. say there's another view as to how this kind of thing can tell us about human behavior, which is actually I think Alexandra's point of view, which is we can learn about our own behavior by the things we project onto a dog. So when it comes to domestic animals, of course, we're in the selection seat with domestic animals. So we select for things that appeal to us, probably, or food-wise, maybe, our taste buds. But in the case of dogs who we don't eat, we're clearly selecting for traits that we find appealing. So this must tell us something about us. And, of, and I, I mean, I know you work enough to know that we make all sorts of mistakes about what because we projected on them, right? Right. Many of our projections could probably, I mean, could, but, some, but most of them really are reflections on ourselves. it seems to me. Um, and, but as to the, and as to that question of kind of what an, looking at animal behavior could tell us about human behavior, I think because we are, don't have access to the human mind, we do that. We just attribute. And as scientists, we say, okay, don't attribute. Instead, just look at behavior. But so we're kind of, we're given, too, there's too much richness in the human. We have, we think, access to each other's minds, or at least a way we feel like it's going to be roughly analogous to my mind, right? Um, and so we don't even really look at behavior so much. I mean, the, those who look at behavior like an ethologist, I th a human behavior, I think of those same types of patterns that Diana's talking about with the dolphins, right? And, and we recapitulate the kind of um, behavior action patterns we have in our early life later on. Again, and the ones that work to you know, get the mate or get the friendship or get the job, we keep those ones and we, we do away with the other ones. But it's the same type of thing. It's just that we talk about it at a higher level. Right? And all of those cognitive, the words we talk, I mean, and this is what is so interesting about, you know, comparative psychologists, all of us who are looking then at non-human mind, is our words are human words for human development. When do we get a theory of mind? When do we have self-awareness? When do we develop empathy or, the, or secondary emotions and so forth? But with all of those, we could say, well, do we really have it? You know, theory of mind is one of those great ones where the theory of mind is thinking, the thing that all humans develop, that we're, where we're thinking at about age three or four, we think what other people know or believe that's different from ourselves, you know, before age three, children aren't really doing that, right? They're classically egocentric, and they think everybody knows what we know. But at age four, they realize they have to wait until their mother is out of the room a cookie, right? And then they can deceive her, because she doesn't know about that. Well, but you could also look at a lot of human behavior and say, are we really acting with a theory of mind? I mean, is what I'm doing now in my attempt to communicate taking into account what everybody, maybe it's implausible, 
everybody else is bringing to the subject so that we are best communicating? Certainly not. I'm just talking, you know, and I'm hoping that some of it hits, right? And I have a general, I'd make a general guess as to what other people's understanding is and how they came to their, the words they're using. But I certainly, I might be of mind at that level. And so the better way would really be, I mean, that's, I am totally a mythologist, but to look at, just say, how do I, how do I change my behavior to best suit situations? And, and that would explain to me huge amounts of, you know, what Freud also tries to explain using the mind. So Ed, so I, let me let me give an alternative. You could you could I uh, I sort of am an, a human ethologist because I t as some of you know I teach the Alexander technique and my own and my own ideas on this. So I I sort of daily observe people, and I teach people performing actions. And one thing that I I observed early on as a teacher and I as well is that even a simple so-called voluntary movement in a human being is not nearly as voluntary as it appears. And you could demonstrate this with someone. You could ask them not to perform an action, and they'll agree with you that they will not, that they do not intend to and will not. And then you could actually vicariously perform the movement for them, and they will perform it against their will, very often. And you're, in my view, by the way, you're demonstrating mind. I mean, you're demonstrating that they've, that there's no way to account except to say that they action, you know, borrowing from William James, who described this kind of thing years ago. So in even the simplest action you could describe uh, in humans, you, could, you can observe something very mechanical and uh, determined, sort of. And in that respect, not very different from other animals. The problem is that humans, unlike any other animal, are capable of observing that and actually raising the process of how they do things to a more conscious level. And that's one thing that I study. I study, I, I use the word mindfulness, but I study kind of mindfulness as a psychophysical process, not just attentional. And my question is, if all, if all of human behavior can be reduced, or 98% of it can be reduced to what we see in animals, why is it that we're capable of being mindful of it all the time? Why is it that we're capable of actually observing our, let's say, selfish motives and saying, I don't want to behave that way. I actually see that something I want to say is pretty much a need to speak, so I'm not going to say that. This quality, this capacity in humans, to me, it separates humans from all the other animals. And it separates our behavior from any animal behavior. Mindfulness alone. And, I, it, and what worries me is that people will go to a, a Buddhist, you know, uh, seminar this and say this is great and then the next week they'll go to a scientific seminar and they say now we're, we're basically animals well which is it I mean we are animals. let's just get that we are well, I animals get that. I get okay, that. okay okay I get that. You're saying that no other animals can show constraint or conscious thought about self I don't or control any... here I'll, I'll stand yeah. my ground no animal is capable of being mindful of practicing conscious attention oh Wait, what does that mean? Yeah, let's get, let's get into a definition here. <laughs> yeah, define it. I don't know what you mean either. Can you tell us exactly what you well, mean? Well, a very, a, very, uh, a very simple, you know, sort of in the moment description of mi mindfulness is simply doing something and being aware you do it, being co uh, consciously aware while you do it. Okay, so I, I, self-aware? Yes. Well, wait a minute, let me talk about this. But this is only a very fringe, of what humans are capable of. Okay. I mean, you're, I, we're capable I, I of... I really don't understand that either. Well, this you know, is, I know, but yeah. this is why I think I'm yeah, here. I'm, and this is, I noticed but, that everyone's pointing in on my controversial comment. But you need to, you need to articulate a little comment. bit better. <laughs> what? Okay, but... Yeah. My, no, give me an before, example. Give before, me a, a solid example. Before we example. go further, um, the problem with when we describe, when we try to explain human behavior by looking at animal behavior is that we segregate the aspects of human behavior that are clearly, in my view, clearly different. And then, when you, and then when you say, hey, this is what I think is clearly different, people say, well, is that even there? Well, I, I, you know, mindfulness is not an easy, uh, um, an easy discipline to learn. 
but we know it can be learned. I mean, there's, no, there's just no question about this. We know that martial artists practice it, people in meditation practice it. So, I, so the, trying to explain what that is may not be so easy. I believe that there are a number of faculties like that, similar to that, that aren't not just mindfulness. But anyway, so. sitting on a perch could, would not, could not be mindful. How would we know? Well, I, 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 I'm not studying parrots, so I can't. Well, I mean, any. <laughs> it but, I, you know, I study children. I study children, and I study children, you know, from a fairly young age. So in my view, kids cannot even remotely approach what mindfulness is Clearly not uh, till they're in their teens, and, and generally speaking later, after their teens, cannot even begin to approach it. So to me, it's a cognitive skill. And so because I see it, in, see it, how difficult it is, you can't even speak of a toddler being mindful. It's just not possible. And that's why I sort of am willing to make the transition to animals. From what I understand of mindfulness, and it's not something I've the idea of sort of monitoring your own feelings and thoughts and becoming more aware of your motivations and your, your overall surrounding. It's an expanded awareness of you and, yeah, one aspect of that, okay. So, it could also be being aware of proprioceptively. Let's say you're sitting here mm -hmm. and you're aware uh, not just having kinesthetic or proprioceptive input about your body, but monitoring it constantly so that it's something that's always in your background awareness. It could be, there are various ways. Or you could be focused on someone, as I am, let's say, to you, but I also may be aware of my peripheral field. And I'm aware of it so that it's something that, if I were a martial artist, I could do that, so that even when I'm attending selectively, someone could enter the room and I would see them enter the room. This is they can't do that. No, I know, but what, yeah, but I'll, yeah, I'll make a distinction. Cats, cats and dogs, I mean, again, I know cats and yeah. some cats and dogs pretty well. Cats are very, very alert in, in various ways, but they are, I think this is going to elicit a lot of controversy, they are subconsciously alert. They can't be consciously alert by definition. Oh, wait a minute. I don't, I, I, that's, yeah. I don't understand that. Yeah. Right. Without, without perhaps, any, yeah. perhaps, but I'm, I'm going to make it. And, I, and, I, and I've written a whole book on this subject. So. Well, having read, a, having read yeah, a book yeah. on the yeah. subject yeah. actually doesn't make it any less un, uh, unfounded. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, the fact that we don't have any... <laughs> that's, a, that's just that lovely thing which we do with each other when we don't know something about a topic like the mind of a bird that we just assume there's nothing in there or that it's just going to be some variation yeah, I, of ours. That's I get that, but it's, now, it's as if now it's I'm not saying... A, I get that, but it's, that is the core of your question. You're saying like the difference is, and I could be wrong, so please correct yeah. me, but the, you're saying the difference is that Animals might be alert, and yet something that's happening in the periphery, sort of that mindful, mo in the moment thing. But the difference is that we are conscious and animals are not conscious. However, I can't know that I'm right about saying that animals are not conscious, but that doesn't matter. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I think there's a, dis a, a an okay. uh, an uh, the distinction to me is, is, I don't think I'm making an unwarranted assumption. Let, I'll t say why. Because we all know, we've all I assume everyone here has handled infants and as a, as sees how an infant... So very often, a, let's say a four or five month old infant is highly alert. Do you think that the infant has a sense of self? My, in my experience, an infant has a sense of self in the way that we do. The consciousness that we, that we ascribe to, human, to adult humans, uh, in general, I would not ascribe that to a four month old. I don't... I say that we do not know if an animal, if the child has a sense of self at that age, now the way we define it, it seems because we're using specific experiment at the, with the five-year-old. One, one could. Uh, there's plenty of research in order to. Yeah, to but there's that. A so lot we more can't. They don't pass certain tests. <laughs> That's fair. Coming up, that suggests that these kids at four to six months old, and I wish I, I, I skimmed just the abstract of this paper. I wish I had read it before coming here. But there was something to, to, to do with, you know, attributing something or other. And they were showing this in a six-month-old through a looking task the surprise about something or other. What, what's, it's not just 
but since somebody else was doing this, where they were checking the, it was the, kind of the kid in an EKG type thing, and the brain was triggering in the way that it would only trigger if the child was very much aware of what it thought the other person was going to do. It's like the, okay, it was something like the person was looking at a, there was a box, and the person, and you put a ball into the box, the cover went over it, and the thing was either surreptitiously taken off or taken off in view or something, and the child was either surprised or not at whether the person was going to go for the ball because they should or should not think the ball was there. Right. The, I'm, I'm doing this in a very sloppy way, but I'm trying to give you a feeling for this experiment. The point was that the child's brain responded the same way an adult brain would respond in that situation based on an attribution of what they thought this a, you know, this other person would expect to find in the box. Okay, which, when I read that, I went, I want to see the, read the whole paper they because... They have the motor skills and the cognitive wherewithal to express it. I mean, right. comprehension precedes that's, production see, in terms of language. Mean, They're stuck. I mean, when we look with animals, we're like looking at pre-verbal yeah, babies. Think, we, you know, so, to me now we are going in a different direction, yeah. which has to do with the issue of consciousness. But since it's four o'clock, we will stop here. <laughs> ah, So please here, make your comments brief. Don't make three different comments, just one. <laughs> Otherwise. Just one. Yeah. You stop the consciousness. Just one, just <laughs> one, one, please. But the, the mic's not on. Well. Yeah, is that, oh yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll just, so that uh, what, it's easy to think that a form is in a non-changeable or final state if we don't consider evolutionary time over hundreds of millions of years. We can use those numbers, but we have no macroscopic or cognitive experience of those time frames. Um, quick story to illustrate this. There's a, a group of people called the Baju. Uh, they live on houseboats. They only come to land um, for, to trade fish for are their boats. Their children are, uh, spend so much time underwater that they see more clearly underwater and than they do in, out of water. They have fish hunters that can do things without weights, without any uh, apparatus, that allow them to go down to 80 feet, slow their heartbeat to 30 beats a minute, and stay to eight minutes. And if one runs that out over thousands or more of years, see physiological changes in what appears to be an end state of design. So that's just the comment. Um, the, 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 so, and then the other is that about the speciality is that a few months ago, I'll send the paper to anyone who hasn't seen it or wants it. Uh, apparently, it looks pretty, pretty this that a single a mutation in a single gene gave rise to our neocortical complexity over time, and that develops at a rate roughly 300 percent faster than the rest of our physiology. So that accounts for some of the things you were talking about. That said, here's the question. It's an ethical question, because mm. uh, we didn't, we didn't, and this is Sandra, um, uh, Irene, Diana, and Irene. If we got to the point of being able, using epigenetics and other biosynthetic techniques, to modify that corresponding gene, if it exists, or in in non-human species, such that we could artificially accelerate the development of their neocortex, this would be, of course, vertebrates with encephalization. Would that be something that any of you would consider doing? And if not, why not? Wow. <laughs> well, if it was a pill, I'd take it. <laughs> but an well, injection, yeah. I'm not having anything to do with <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> I mean, for the, for the speed study, the most uh, dogs, I, I mean, again, I'm, I am a little, going to be a little parochial. 
intentionally, uh, cognizantly in my response, but I think that part of what works for them is actually not um, uh, being self-sufficient. I mean, they're, it is their dependency on and therefore, giving them something which kind of promoted their ability to evolve mm. beyond us would not be useful for that species, that's so my feeling. I, I wanted to just link that to the, the, the difference, the one difference between us and everything and the other species is that we have this remarkably complex abstract language and, then we, and that we can then categorize and refer to of the world even if the correspondence with what we've modeled is not reliable. But that complexity of our linguistic capability is really what sets us apart, uh, as far as we can tell, because no one else is giving, no parrots are yet giving talks at Columbia. Okay. I'd love to be able to talk that way, and also, but I really <laughs> silence, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but oh maybe God, what if they had language? <laughs> oh, they'd be impossible, wouldn't they? <laughs> I enjoyed very much hearing about the tests that you ran, measuring the intellectual intelligence of other species. I'm wondering if anyone's, I wonder if anyone is doing any work measuring the emotional intelligence in other species. It's extremely difficult, and I'll say it because when we would, we, if we tried to do that, we would be even worse at imposing our patterns on them. So for example, I can you know, work with the bird and I'll say, stop doing that, you're gonna get bitten. And the student says, how do you know that? And I say, look at the body language. Okay, the feathers are ruffled, the eyes are slitted, the, you know, the head of the, the parrot versus the back of the, I mean, I'm reading his body language. Now, is he angry? Is he bored? You know, I don't know why he's, what, what emotional underpinning is going on, but I can read the behavior. And I, I kind of joke about it that even as humans, we're really rotten about understanding what somebody else is doing and interpreting it appropriately. I mean, you'll, you'll go to your significant other and say, you know, why did you say that? And you, well, I didn't mean to say it that way. I didn't, I wasn't, yeah, and stuff. So, so it's really hard to do this emotional thing because we're so bad at it with our, as humans with one another. To impose it on animals, I find it's just harder. I mean, we can read the behavior. We we know what, what behavioral actions are going to lead to other actions, but that underlying emotional... I under think next time you have to bring your significant other. <laughs> well, bird, I no longer know have one. I no longer have a it's human a one. There's a reason, There's a reason you know, for that. I, I agree with Irene, I, although I think that um, as a scientist, what we try to do is increase our powers of observation and our ability to sort of bring together a lot of maybe anecdotal information and look at it more systematically. So for example, with dolphins and elephants, um, in our field we can watch responses to the death of a conspecific another of their own group. And again, we don't know what it means, but what you'll see often is things that look very much like grieving in humans. If it's, an example is you have eight dolphins in a facility, Two are bonded, Spock and Shiloh. I'll just give goofy names. Spock dies, Shiloh's the one in the group that stops eating, starts sulking, and takes a week to start eating and getting with the other uh, animals again. And you know, when we look at it in human terms, it looks like grief. What it is to an animal may be, may there may be physiological disturbances, all sorts of stressors, but that's sort of where we are, so we try to look more systematically at that. We can look at signs for what we would say are empathy or caregiving or perspective taking in dolphins and elephants and bonobos, other animals, and dogs. You'll see behavior where an animal is injured or ill, and the others will give caregiving, will hold them up at the surface. They don't all do it, they don't always do it. It's very flexible. It's often to the ones they're closest with. They'll often be to provide care. So when we look at those kinds of things, or look at an, a paper came out uh, last year by Plotnick and Duval, where they looked at one elephant showing conciliatory behavior to another that was distressed. They put their trunk around the animal and they look at how that happens. Again, we don't know what's going on in the emotional uh, in the emotional world of those animals, but what we do know is they, many animals have this, from rats to 
to elephants, mm -hmm. to dolphins, have similar subcortical areas in their brain that respond emotionally in different ways to fear, to, to caring with, for young and other things. So there's some interesting you know, similarities, whether it's the same kind of emotion, but maybe that doesn't make a difference if it's the same, because we would never know if it's the same. How do you know if it's ever going to be the same? But, uh, you, you know, my question that I asked before, you just touched on it, that uh, you said when the other dolphin is not eating and so on, you said it may not, we don't know what the emotion is, but it may be some physiological response. But that's also true with humans, right? Yeah. In, the, in that mm -hmm. sense, we, we are identical, triggers. but we secondarily may have explanations for what we are doing. Right. And also animals, many animals show ulcers under conditions. Mm -hmm. And for us, it can come mm -hmm. from different things, bacterial or... Yeah. I'm going to approach this from another angle because I'm coming from another field. Um, I'm a painter and art historian. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in, painters often say, I'm only a link in a chain. I'm an individual, but I'm carrying on things that have happened in the past and the history of others. So carrying within one is the history of other actions, other developments. So the mind is not just a separate It's an entity, a depository of history of all kinds, and therefore uh, that creates a form of evolution or development, a different kind of form, but it's a form that we are building constantly on others' lives who have gone through a conscious life. And I wonder how you can relate that to the animal kingdom, this history and culture in which an individual life is beyond their life because they have, they have imbibed other lives, other consciousnesses. Great question. <laughs> bird song dialects, I mean, there's, the birds will learn of their area, it's a cultural tra tradition, tweak it a little bit for individual differences, that's their little take on it, but it's a cultural tradition and you can see the, the changes over time, you can see the evolution of these things based on, you know, what's happening the, in the world, I mean, if you know, if the if the area that they're living in gets more more um, more tree-like, they'll have to shift frequencies a little bit and things like that. I mean, that's one one version of it. I went to graduate school with a, a number of people who believed um, and espoused that the unit of interest was really not the cognition in the brain, but a distributed cognition of a group, mm. and that's how they studied how do people work together in a group. It's not one person who's solving the problems. I, as a human, am a tool user. I make most of the tools which I use. I let somebody else make them, and so as a, so it makes more sense to talk about the cognition of a group, and you can define the group variously. And I think in some ways. Lots of different animal societies could also be described that way, and that is a kind of historical mm -hmm. cognition. In other words, the group operates because lots of different members have, been, have different roles or understandings such that as an entire group they have a cognitive ability. Um, I think that might be one way to recast the type of thing you're talking about such that it, it might be relevant for humans and non-humans. I think the idea of also matriarchs, the older females, there's data coming out showing that in elephant societies and in cetacean societies that these female matriarchs seem to carry the knowledge and that's passed down. There's increasing evidence for cultural within these societies and that this matriarch, the non -reproduct, no longer reproductive female, leads the group in Africa to the right places based on seasons and things. And when of those animals from poaching or whatever, it has detrimental effects on the groups. Taking out males that are, that are uh, male elephants by poachers have effects on the um, acculturation and control of the younger males. So these key roles are important, but carrying the knowledge, um, having a, a real effect on behavior of others around you. I think it's a great point. Thanks. Thank you. Do you not want to say anything about this? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, so there, there's little bits of evidence here and there of, of this kind of cultural transmission, but you don't really find it, find it in humans until you get to pretty modern humans. I mean, I think you, you, have, you could trump me here on this, but I think much like technology in the Bronze Age, I think art in the Bronze Age or through thousands of years remained relatively similar. People made artifacts and, you know, for thousands of years the artifacts all look sort of the same, but now we have, you know, 
I, I mean, now the arts are changing all the time. I mean, they move at a much more rapid pace. And that's not, that has nothing to do with evolution. That is a cultural thing uh, that humans they move, do. They move at a more rapid pace. Uh, maybe the concept of the individual, uh, which evolved through time, has also changed things in that way, so that an individual feels that within themselves, a, a da Vinci or even earlier than that, can add a whole new dimension that, this given, that aren't part of the canon of an age. But I think there's always been change. I don't think the Bronze Age was, I think it was a slower evolution, but it was there. I don't believe there's any stagnant period ever. I don't, I don't believe in vacuums. But the concept of the individual, individual life, did change that, yes. I hope I won't be too unpopular if I start out by correcting two things that grated on my ears like fingernails on a One being that there could be some evolution of human intelligence in the last 5,000 years, which 5,000 years is nothing in human evolution. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about the emergence of a kind of mentality between 100,000... We change it to 50 thousand, million but, so you don't get... Huh? <laughs> we change it to 50 million, you don't get upset. No, no, no now you're way up. No, now you're way on the other side. But now we didn't, we said the just side. the opposite. I just want to be clear. Huh? We said just the opposite. It couldn't possibly be evolution in 5,000 years. All right. Uh, but, but I mean, I, I mean five, we, they were building pyramids. They were quite yeah, as right. intelligent as, uh, as we are. I had the same are. exact brain we have five, now. I absolutely 5, agree with nothing. you. nothing. All right, we won't quibble over the time, but the, the paintings paintings and the and the Chauvet paintings were between 30,000 and 40 years ago. Uh, Neanderthals were still, what we just discovered some, some new kinds of tools and possibly art in the rudiments of Neanderthals that died out uh, 40,000 years ago. I leave that topic now. Second thing that bothered me was the idea of uh, being upright somehow facilitates the kind of intelligence that we have. I need that we had at least 17 different kinds of hominins wandering around the world uh, that were all more or less upright. And only Homo sapiens came up with what we think we have. These, uh, these were creatures like uh, Artipithecus ramidus and uh, Australopithecus, uh, all of these creatures. Uh, could walk, they had good hands. In fact, it's generally understood by anthropology now that uh, uh, walking upright was not correlated with intelligence at all. Uh, the intelligence came way after there were all of these upright hominids walking around. Look at Bonobo, for instance, and that's a whole story in itself. They often walk upright, they're very bright, they don't do art, they don't do life. Uh, so it cannot be a, a walking but they're, upright. But they're not upright, so I'm not sure why you... They're not actually upright, so why do you mention... Oh, they're very they often are. upright. No I, mean a yeah. no, I mean, they're not a fully upright. I thought, I thought you were referring to a well, fully upright. Well, full is fully upright. I'm talking about I mean, fully upright. <laughs> <laughs> But no, only, no, 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 no. I thought you just said Homo sapiens. Uh, They're the I, I, only fully upright species. I don't mean to be disrespectful. I want to be polite. But you're but totally that is. off the beam. You, know, that you, is. Don't, you, you don't have a grasp of the range of upright creatures that did not I don't have understand. It. You're talking about bipedalism. We are the only fully upright species. That's, I mean, there's no debate on this in the, in, in, uh, among uh, among scientists, we're the only fully upright well, species. Well, there is debate about it, but I want to drop it now. I want to drop it now. So what is your question? I want to drop it now. You can read my book, and maybe my book is totally wrong, too. <laughs> Paul Darwin's universe. Um, what I really want to bring up is this, because uh, I've been fortunate for the last three years to be the director of a, uh, a project on Alfred Russell uh, for the Templeton Foundation. Now, you may not know him, some of you may know he was Darwin's junior. He was the man that came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection. Uh, to shorten the story, at the same time Darwin did, they published it together, they, uh, they share co-credit. Uh, 
but they had a very interesting opinion. And that difference of opinion was that Wallace, who was a great naturalist, out in the field for many years, observed many animals, he drew what I call a white picket fence around human mentality, around human consciousness, around human cognition. Uh, he thought that natural selection could not account for the kind of consciousness we're talking about. And Darwin said, what, what do you mean? Everything goes by gradual steps. There's no great leaps. And Wallace and he said, you don't understand natural selection. Wallace said, I'm the inventor of it along with you. I understand natural selection. And what natural selection says is that a trait has to have a utility to an organism in order to be Now, if you have an ape, said Wallace, wandering around and eating lizards and like a pretty well surviving and having a social group and having all kinds of behavior, why would he need to Symphonies. Why would he need to have math? Why would he indeed even need to have uh, the sophistication of language beyond a very, very basic uh, thing? And and uh, uh, he said, y you can't. Uh, you, an animal cannot de develop something in advance of its needs. And uh, Darwin wrote him a famous letter in 18. Said, I hope you have not murdered too completely your own and my child, <laughs> meaning natural selection. Wallace wrote many books on this uh, later The Place of Man in Nature, The World of Life, and so on, in which he continued this theme. And you talk about special sauce. Wallace thought there was special sauce. <laughs> Wallace thought there was an infusion of spirit from an unseen universe of spirit, a cosmic intelligence. He never used the word God. He did not like organized religion. But he thought there was some kind of intelligence in nature guiding evolution and responsible for infusing and injecting in humans this, what some call emergent quality, uh, that was more than the sum of its parts. This is not a question, and I don't want to hog the floor. I've said my piece. Thank you. <laughs> Questions will stop here. Very good, thank you all. Thank you. Well, that was interesting. That was interesting and fun. I think those were mostly malaria.